Uh, let me know our people on session, and we can help address those. You know, that's what we're looking forward to what, what we're going to do in the future, which is why I'm here as well. Um, so uh, we're, we're dealing with that. And I do have a, a, a note on the, the bulletin. It's a, a slightly different format, uh, the reason being uh, Sarah didn't want me to, to work with a publisher or the different programs that she uses because she was out dealing with a slight sickness this week. Um, so that's why it's not in color. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I did try my best. Um, and uh, she should be back and, and working on that. So um, thank you for bearing with the pastor and trying to come in on that. <laughs> Friendship Circle will meet at 6 o'clock Tuesday at the Mexican restaurant Casa Real. That's the one out by Tractor Supply. You're all welcome to come. The Mary Martha Circle will be starting a new Bible study, and it starts tomorrow at 1.30 in the church library. So we'd love to have you. Seeing no other announcements, please join me in the call of worship based on Psalm 51. May your love and mercy be upon us today, O Lord. Cleanse and refresh us from every transgression. Let your joy and gladness dawn in our spirits, and the recreating power of your spirit renew us. Have mercy upon us, O God, and let your spirit lead us in truth and righteousness. Let us worship God. Verse 10 is 482. Please stand. Friends, hear the good news. 
While it is true that we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say, in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God for this grace. Amen. Losing one of them, 
does not move the 99 from the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found a sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Word of the Lord. Thirsty, the shepherd took them to a quiet stream to drink. 
The sheep washed his sheep carefully as they ate grass and drank water from the street. He wanted to make sure that they were safe. Now, every night, the shepherd counted his sheep. That way, he could make sure that none were missing. Now, how many sheep can you count on this page? Twenty. Twenty on this. And this shepherd had a hundred sheep. Then, so like your mom and dad, uh, tucks you into bed at night, the shepherd brought a sheep into the sheep fold. Now, a sheep fold is a safe place with a fence around it. The sheep fold protected the sheep from wolves and kept the little lambs from running away. Alright. One night, the shepherd was camping sheep, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and he stopped to pull some brambles out of a fuzzy uh, back, eight and ten, on and on, but there were only ninety-nine. And something is wrong, said the shepherd. I should have one hundred sheep. So he counted them again. One lamb is missing, the shepherd cried. Now the shepherd knew that one little lamb must have wandered away from the others. It was out there somewhere on the mountainside, lost. So he left the 99 sheep in the sheepfold and went to search for the little lost lamb. He got tired of his walk with the mountain, but did not stop to rest. He wouldn't give up until he found the lamb. Down a rocky path, over an outside he went, looking everywhere for his little lamb. Yes, and then suddenly he stopped. What was that sound here? It sounded like the frightened ba ba of a little lamb. The shepherd heard toward the sun. There, near the mountain, she saw his lost lamb. The lamb was caught up in the thorn bush. He ran quickly to the lamb. The shepherd carefully separated the branches with his shepherd's staff, then he pulled the lamb to see. The shepherd was happy as he lifted the little lamb to his shoulder and gently he carried it all the way back to the other sheep. And when the shepherd got home that night, okay, come here. <laughs> he called his friend. He was so happy he found his little lost lamb. He wanted to celebrate. So he invited all his friends to come over to, uh, to his house and he gave them good things to eat and drink while he told them how he found his land. It is a celebration. Jesus is like the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. We are like the sheep in the story because we need Jesus to help us and take care of us. Jesus loves us and knows our needs. He watches out for us and keeps us who gives us the food, water, rest, and love that we need. Jesus wants us to follow him and you know, never leave us or forget about us. We are his forever and ever. Father, you love each and every one of us. We are thankful that you don't give up on us when we get lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We should be enough to share. <laughs> Chapter 1, verses 12 through 17, the Lord's grace to Paul, the sermon we focus on in Luke chapter 14. Gratitude for mercy. I am grateful to Jesus Christ our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. For, for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. For the kingdom of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, to be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
Well, cartoonist Charles Schultz drew a wonderful penis strip in which Lucy comes up to her brother Linus and says, You? A doctor? Ha! That's a big laugh. You could never be a doctor. You know why? Because you don't love mankind. And off she goes, jumping rope. Linus shouts after her, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> well, the Pharisees and the scribes were like Linus. They cared about pleasing God, they did, but couldn't stand that God cared about all people. They rejoiced over sin and repentance, but objected to Jesus hanging out with sinners. Jesus offended their sensibilities with his promiscuous meal sharing with outcasts. After all, the Pharisees and scribes were the proper people, the religious insiders who abided by the rules and drew the boundaries. They believed one is known by the company one keeps. Instead of associating with people they thought did bad things, the scribes and Pharisees pointed them out, ridiculed and shunned them. They could have said, like Linus, I love my neighbor, it's those people I can't stand. It's not that the Pharisees and scribes were bad people, they actually were doing what they thought were right and was right in the eyes of God. The problem was they got the religion all wrong. They thought it was up to them to earn God's acceptance. They thought their salvation depended on their worthiness based on good behavior. They believed some were outside God's favor. They protected their good reputations by refusing to keep company with people they considered below them. Their image of God seemed to be of a distant, harsh deity whose arms were crossed over the chest, fists clenched, and not acceptance sparingly, only to those who fulfilled certain religious obligations. Jesus embodied a direct challenge to their beliefs and behavior. He knew tax collectors made their money by extracting taxes from the occupying, for the occupying government and jacked up the fees so they could pocket some money for themselves. And Jesus knew that sinners were primarily poor, common folk, who were so concerned with figuring out where the next meal would come, that they didn't have time or money for religious obligations. They were first and foremost human beings who were alienated from polite society and who were eager for the love of Jesus. Jesus drew them to himself and to one another, thus making the community. They may not have been the only people who truly wanted to be with him, hungry for his good news, eager to offer and receive his friendship. It would not have been nearly as much fun for Jesus to break bread with critical naysayers who were always testing Jesus and failing to see their own need for God's grace. There was a pastor who remembered for his mantra and his church that the church is called to reach out to the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely. But while the leadership of that pastor was significant, the language of that mantra is problematic. One newspaper article misquoted him saying, the least, the last, the lonely, and the losers. No one wants to be regarded as a loser, let alone the least last. Whenever we categorize people, we tend to see them simply as that label, and not to see the whole person. A few men who formerly had been incarcerated fought against this stigmatization by wearing t-shirts that said, I am more than my mistake. Negative labels distance us from whole groups of people, other people. Categorization diminishes seeing the fullness of persons, including their potential and giftedness. Labeling short changes uh, growth and healing. It also reinforces blaming the victim, in which we assume someone is flawed or at fault for his or her own plight, overlooking the reality that many people are victims of trauma and injustice, not of their own. These were the folks who would not be invited to dinner. Sharing a meal in Jesus' day, of course, was significant, uh, bringing bread with another uh, extended honor and, and peace and friendship to the guests. Giving hospitality was a loaded action, uh, loaded sociologically, politically, and theologically. By his actions, Jesus revealed a different God, a radically inclusive, loving God. Jesus sought out people who were marginalized and welcomed them. He took the initiative and forgave them even before they repented. He treated all people with respect and dignity as full human beings. He intentionally reversed the esteemed position so that, and the Pharisees and the scribes who got bummed, they noticed the big time. They remembered that he welcomed sinners. They grumbled. He eats with them. They wondered, who is this guy, and what kind of religion does he follow? Noted American evangelist Tony Campolo tells of visiting an all-night diner in Hawaii while suffering from jet lag and unable to sleep. You might have heard the story before. It's so Tony Campolo. You know what I'm saying? But from his booth, 
He overheard a conversation among several ladies of the night. <clears throat> One said that the next day would be her 39th birthday. And sadly, she confessed that she had never in her life had a birthday party. Tony secretly arranged with the manager of that diner to throw a surprise party for the woman. And the next night, the woman and her friends were stunned and thrilled, and Tony led the group in prayer. Later, the diner manager asked Tony, what kind of church do you belong to? And he replied, I belong to the kind of church that throws birthday parties for ladies of the night at 3.30 in the morning. Now that was Jesus' kind of church. Some people ask, aren't all religions alike? What makes Christianity distinctive? No miracles and other things can be found in other religions and writings. The ethical, beautiful teachings of Jesus, like love your neighbor and forgive your enemy, are based on Jewish ethics. Other religions also hold that God is love. Much of what Christians believe is shared by people all over the world. But there is something distinctive in Christianity. Hugh Montefiore, a Jewish biblical scholar, said what is unique is this affirmation, that God seeks us and finds us. Christian theologian C.S. Lewis said what is unique is God's grace. No other world religion has ever made the ultimate acceptance by God so absolutely unconditional. God's grace and this is us all. Jesus Christ reveals God as radically inclusive, loving God, the, the God of grace, who persistently pursues us with amazing love no matter how much we mess up. Jesus told three parables that use thoughtful book and metaphors for God. The most familiar is the father and the prodigal son. The others are the shepherd and the woman. Back then, shepherds experienced some disdain. Uh, women were treated as second-class citizens, and these are two of the images Jesus chose to reveal who God is and how God loves. So in spite of, or perhaps because of, their low standing in society, these two types of people were perfect metaphors for God. That is, because of what they did. When the shepherd discovered one of his flock was missing, he immediately left the 99 of his sheep to go find the one that was lost, not stopping his search until the sheep was found. And when the woman realized she lost one of her few precious coins, she immediately started cleaning her house, searching anywhere and everywhere, and didn't stop until she found it. Both were filled with joy when they found what was lost. I imagine we have all lost something precious. Now you remember how it felt. You remember what you did. You probably retraced your steps, dumped out your, your purse or your pockets, you searched your coat pockets, went through all of your luggage or your laundry, your drawers, such as through waste baskets, the garbage can, that brings up an image not too long ago I did that. Made phone calls, got others involved in the search. You didn't stop until you finally found what you had lost or exhausted all possibilities. And then, if you found it, what a relief and joy. You tell others your good news and they celebrate with you. Rejoicing is what God does after finding lost children and bringing them home. The Syria Civil Defense, also known as the White Helmets, is a group of dedicated volunteers in Syria who risk bombs, chemical attacks, and sniper fire every day they go out to rescue civilians. There is a documentary on Netflix on their organization and their work. They dig through the rubble of destroyed buildings, searching for trapped children and adults, knowing that each hour that passes increases the likelihood of death for any survivors. They work without a break, hour after hour, digging through slabs of concrete, piles of rock, and sharp debris. More than once, they have given all they had in pursuit of one tiny baby whose small whimper had been heard hours before. And even, the, even though more than 500,000 have been killed and wounded by the atrocious bombing that we pray will end, that nation and others, they honor the life of one person. It is significant that we remember those who dug through the pile of debris after 9-11 to rescue who they could as this is the 21st anniversary of that. On the day following the attacks, 11 people on that day were rescued from the rubble, including six firefighters and three police officers. And they were able to rescue more, and the final survivor, Port Authority Secretary Janelle Desmond McMillan, was rescued 24 seven hours after the collapse of the North Town. What celebration, what incredible relief and joy and gratitude they express when they recover someone still alive. That's how much God gives God's self to find us. That's how precious we are in God's sight. God rejoices in our well-being. God loves us personally and intimately, even though each of us is but one among billions of people. 
There are many ways, of course, that we can get lost. Sometimes being lost is imposed on people by society. Uh, there's a, a lot of youth, uh, African American youth in Chicago, especially males, who have been called the lost generation, as too many are traumatized, wounded, and killed by gun violence. Lostness occurs when people abuse one another, leaving victims with physical and emotional scars. Lostness can be self imposed, it's when we pursue the false path of living only for ourselves. We can also feel lost in the midst of intense suffering and physical pain. We may feel lost after the death of someone we dearly love or the rupture of any relationship that grounds us and helps us to know who we are. We may feel lost when the dreams you long for um, and long to have carried out are not becoming reality. Being lost, feeling isolated or uncertain, aimlessly drifting, taking the wrong turn is the experience many of us have known. And usually when we are lost, we cannot find our way home by ourselves. We need another to find us. Notice the parables Jesus offers us today at the beginning of this chapter of Luke. They're not about being wrong, they're, they're about being lost. A sheep is lost, a coin is lost. There's nothing about culpability, blame, or finding fault. That doesn't seem to be Jesus' concern. His concern is for the one that is lost, missing, or absent. Jesus doesn't explain how the lost becomes lost. He doesn't blame or judge. And that's not the issue. The issue for Jesus is recovering and Lost. In Jesus' parables, neither lost sheep nor the coin could do anything to get found. A lost sheep that is able to bleed out in distress often will not do so out of fear. Instead, it will curl up and lie down in the wild brush, uh, hiding from predators. It is so fearful in its seclusion that it cannot help its own rescue. With the sheep immobilized, the shepherd must bear the full weight. Similarly, the lost coin cannot roll itself into a more visible place, or shine more brightly, or to attract attention to itself. Its rescue is totally dependent upon the woman's diligence. When we are lost, we need God to help find us. The good news is that God comes looking for you. God doesn't wait for you to do anything, but comes searching for you, picking you up, carrying you home, restoring your life. I confess that if I was with the Pharisees, I might as well be confused about what Jesus is doing and teaching. Uh, what do a lost sheep and a lost coin have to do with repentance? Jesus' parable maybe falls apart a little bit here, right, for our sensibilities. Did the sheep or the coin sin by being lost? Could a sheep or coin repent? The sheep may have felt relief at being found or not, but certainly it wouldn't have made any difference to the coin whether it was with the other 90 coins or off on four somewhere. If Jesus' message was that he needed to go about to the sinners and get them to repent, it probably wouldn't have been so controversial. The Pharisees and the scribes may have even appreciated that Jesus was trying to clean up the, the riffraff, moving the communal salvation along by helping to eliminate sin in the midst. They would have understood if he had had ta table fellowship with them after the repentance and cleansing and renewal after they became respectable. But Jesus does it all backwards to them. He values them right away. He searches them out and invites them in, not to make them acceptable and worthy, but because he recognizes, as does the shepherd and the woman with the coin, that they are already of great value and worth, worth looking for, worth celebrating. There is so much beauty in the parables of Jesus, and some of it is in their ambiguity. We may not be sure what the message is for the Pharisees and the scribes, or for us. Is he suggesting that they and we are to join him in the search for the lost? Is that what we need to look at again, uh, that those we would easily let slip away, that those we have not recognized as important to the whole? I mean, we can think about the, the round completeness of a hundred, or a perfect ten. 99 and, and 9 imply that there is something missing. Things are incomplete, not as they should be. And maybe that matters enough to put effort into the search. Maybe it is a message to think about what is missing for us. We can be delighted with what we have, but there may be something, someone missing from our lives, perhaps from our church, that would help make it more complete. Maybe we have to ponder that more. Or is the message the Pharisees and scribes and us, that we should celebrate more over lost being found. Can we be happy about signs of reconciliation and forgiveness 
uh, baby steps, if you will, integrity and blessing that we see, even when they're happening in another person's or another nation's life? Or do we cling to resentment to grudge as an enemy? Or is the message to the Pharisees and the Christ and to us that no matter how we get lost, or how lost we get, Jesus will come looking for us. Even if we get jealous, cling to resentment, refuse to celebrate, still Jesus sees our power, recognizes that we are an important part of the whole and will search and search until he finds us. And he doesn't just want to find us, he won't look begrudgingly, but is eager to find us, to reunite with us with the rest, and to have a big celebration. Are we part of the 99? The one lost, the, the seeker, or one of the rejoicers? Yes, yes we are. And this parable is less about the Pharisees and scribes and us than it is about God and Jesus, who always sees our God, will always search us out, will always rejoice over finding us. Maya Angelou told a wonderful story about herself when she first came to San Francisco as a young woman and became sophisticated. She thought part of being sophisticated was to be agnostic. It wasn't that she stopped believing in God, just that God no longer frequented in the neighborhoods that she frequented. She was taking voice lessons at the time, her teacher gave her an exercise where she used to read from some religious pamphlet. The reading ended with these words, God loves her. She finished the reading and put the pamphlet down. The teacher said, I want you to read that last sentence again. So she picked it up and read it again, this time somewhat sarcastically, and put it down again. Teacher said, read it again. She read it again. Then Maya described what happened. After about the seventh repetition, I began to sense there might be some truth in this statement. That there was a possibility that God really loves me, Maya Angelou. I suddenly began to cry at the blindness of it all. I knew if God loved me, I could do wonderful things. I could do great things. I could learn anything. I could achieve anything. For what could stand against me with God since one person, any person with God, forms the majority? God finds us. That's the unique message of the Christian faith. God seeks you and finds you. Do you want to know who you are? You are a beloved child of God. Do you want to know who God is? God is the God of grace. God loves humankind. And as for people, God loves all people too. God loves them. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Amen. Our next hymn. Our next hymn this morning is I Love to Tell the Story. It is the. Uh, Insert uh, often yellow light on white paper. Now please stand as we sing this hymn.
we see the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, as we have it printed in the book. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, now is an opportunity to lift up any prayer requests we have. Uh, raise your hand on the microphone, come around so we can hear it. I just wanted to give you a quick update on my dad. I know you all have been praying for him, and I thank you very much for that. Um, he is about to transition from his walker to a cane, and yesterday was a very happy day for him because he actually climbed on his lawnmower and was going back up. <laughs> so, so, but, but he's been extremely, extremely blessed this week. We've had visitors from grandchildren, cousins, and my sisters here. So I just wanted to let you all know that he is progressing greatly, and we thank you for his prayers. If there are no other prayer requests, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Hang on, oh, we have one? Okay. Well, isn't Dr. Minecraft in this week? Is he Kevin's prayer? I think he's. Actually, I've heard that he, he had it on, on Wednesday, and now it's with family. Uh, okay. Maybe we should pray for Dr. Minecraft. Yes, absolutely. All right, if there are no other prayer requests, so let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for these wonderful and amazing stories that get to your amazing grace for us and for everyone. But we pray that we will be able to remember this, to think about your words, to um, pour over your holy scriptures, to, to be reminded of your incredible love, that we might be able to rejoice in that. And rejoice in others who are also rejoicing in that and coming to see you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you that we get to be part of that as this church, as individuals, and we pray that we might be able to extend that to others as you lead us into our community, uh, into those areas that uh, we are involved in and uh, participate in. Lord, thank you. And we pray that we will get even better at celebrating that and as the ways that you guys as a church uh, participate in your, in your work of grace and sharing the message of Christ. Lord, in the midst of all that, too, we also have these prayer requests that we bring before you. Uh, Lord, for people that are, are sick or recovered, or people that just pop into mind and we want to pray for them. I want to pray for those things that we read about in the paper or online. I ask that you will be involved in those situations, and, and possibly, as you call us, that we might be able to have the courage to step into those places where you call us, exercising our faith. Uh, seeing you working in, in our lives and around us, that we might be able to use the gifts you have given us uh, to do those things you have called us to do. So Lord, guide us in that entire process as individuals and as a church. Lord, we also we want to bring before you our, our prayer requests. We pray for the families that, that have recently lost one loved ones in our church. Um, we pray for the Bachmans and for the Stoddards and for all those that are still grieving and going through all the different emotions as they're experiencing new days. Uh, with this uh, having happened, happened, or continue to lift up those who will come alongside and be in your presence and offer an encouraging word or a meal, a time to, to be together. Lord, thank you for the ways we've been able to do that and the ways we might further do that. And not just for those who have recently passed away, those that are grieving, but also have experienced that earlier in the year and last year and previous years too. Help us to help all those that we might be able to do so. I love we lift up the, the Linker family as they are experiencing that right now and being together in Colorado. We pray for Will's uh, healing after his surgery. We pray that he'll be able to get back on his feet and do time, and that um, the time together with family will be significant as they lift up uh, the life uh, that his brother uh, who had. Uh, I love we pray for Madeline Walden and Gloria Marsh. 
as we lift up and continue to pray uh, for Frank Wongfeld, Daniel Treadway, Okun, Frank, Jay and Cindy Whitt, and all those that uh, are in different health needs or recuperating, we lift them up to you. Lord, we certainly pray for those who are suffering from addiction and for those that need help on the next step that they might need to take to be free of that or to help to deal with those addictions that are on their lives, either known or unknown, for the ones that we identify as a society and those we don't, uh, those that, want that might remain hidden. We pray for your healing work in all of those situations, in all of those lives and families. We lift up those organizations that are, are most effective and in doing that and helping to see people uh, be free from those that suffer. We lift up uh, the country of Ukraine and continue to pray for peace and miracles to make that happen. A lot of us we hear of ongoing uh, violence and destruction, certainly continue to pray for refugees, uh, for uh, even school students, as we are often take for granted being able to go to school, uh, and that has been thrown into disarray, uh, certainly in Ukraine and the countries surrounding that. So we pray for the, the resources uh, for them as they go through difficult time. We we'll continue to pray for those that have suffered from COVID-19 and those that uh, continue to have to deal with that, and even those that are grieving, uh, having lost loved ones. And that's the schools and businesses try to deal with uh, keeping the public healthy and everything, but we pray for wisdom uh, and for ongoing support and research and things uh, that need to be done to continue to deal with COVID-19. We lift that up to you. We lift up to you the, the difficulty that the high inflation has brought. And we pray for continued thriving for as many people as possible. And we pray that they might be able to bring that down to acceptable or levels that are less threatening to the well-being of so many. We pray for those that have not had clean water in Jackson, Mississippi. And we pray that they might be able to get those systems in place. We know that it would cost a lot of money and be a lot of work, but we pray that that community and all communities will be able to have clean drinking water. But we thank you that we're able to enjoy that and we pray that for that community and others that may not have it. Lord, we lift them up to you. We also pray for the flooding and the devastation wrought in Pakistan. And we pray for that country to be able to get back on its feet. And for the aid organizations, their, their own organizations as well, to be able to help out as many people as possible that have been displaced by that. And for all those that are dealing with. Um, different devastations that have been affecting uh, different areas of our planet. But we also want to lift up any and all prayer requests we haven't heard out loud. Uh, be in those situations and people that we are longing to see have some meaningful change. Even if we may not be able to see it, we lift them up to you. Uh, we pray for ways that we might be able to uh, see continued uh, safety for those that might be threatened or those that are vulnerable. We pray for um, ongoing situations that, that seem impossible, that, that can be possible through your power. Lord, we ask that you be with us in those situations and continue to let them up to turn to you and to see you at, at work in them and also in us. And with that, Lord, we want to pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is a time of offering our tithes and gifts. We have a plate in the back, and you can give, and you can also send something to the church address if you so uh, please. And now during the time of offering, uh, Tori, let us offer ourselves to God.
for all of your gifts. And we pray that we might be great stewards of them, to see them be a blessing for us and our families, and also as we give and see your kingdom at work in that giving. We pray that we might be able to, to see your kingdom and to participate in it. And thank you for that opportunity. Lord, thank you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Our, our next hymn is hymn number 142. All hail the power of Jesus' name. to go out in the world in peace, expect always the unexpected, and anticipate miracles knowing that with God all things are possible. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us both this day and always. Amen.